My name is Paul Grogan, and in this video I'm going to be teaching you how to play the introductory game of Tash Kalar, Arena of Legends. In Tash Kalar, each player takes on the role of a dueling mage who summons fantastical beings by creating magical stones and arranging them into specific patterns of power. There are a few ways to play Tash Kalar, and each has its own style of play and victory conditions. The introductory game is a simplified two-player version of the high form, where the mages are attempting to complete tasks set for them by the lords of the arena. These tasks are worth victory points, and you guessed it, the player with the most victory points wins the game. Before we go into the rules, let's take a look at what you get in the box. First up, we have the game board, which is two-sided. For the introductory game, we're going to be using this side of the board, which has these nine shaded spaces at the centre. You will also notice some red and green spaces. These have no specific rules, but are referred to by the effect on certain cards. The scoring boards are only used when playing the deathmatch variant. However, we will need the red and the blue boards. Flip them over to form the stand where the Lords of the Arena display the tasks they set for the mages. These are the backs for the four different types of cards in the game. These are the beings cards, the creatures that the mages will summon, and they are divided into four schools of magic. For this game, place the Sylvan and Highland cards back into the box. We will only be using the two Imperial school decks, which are identical apart from the colour. Each player will use one of these decks during the game. The flare cards are used whenever the magical forces in the arena are out of balance. Mages may invoke a flare if they are falling too far behind, and they give additional options to allow the mage to recover their position. Task cards are the key to victory. Mages score points by completing these. They are divided into two types, the advanced ones having a darker background. We won't be needing those for the first game, so remove those from the deck. Ah, the legendary cards. These represent the most powerful beings in the game, and despite them being really epic, the rules suggest that you don't use them for your first game, so put them somewhere safe for now, but keep a close eye on that fire dragon, as he can cause a lot of mischief if left alone too long. These pieces represent the magical stones of Calorite that the mages will create in the arena. The colours correspond to the schools of magic, so for the introductory game we will be using the red and blue pieces only. There are three types of pieces, the common pieces are the lowest rank, the heroic pieces are the middle rank, and the legendary pieces are the highest rank. The circular pieces are two-sided, with the common symbol on one side and heroic on the other. To set up your first game, use this side of the game board and place the two task boards alongside like this. Decide who will play the Northern Empire and give them the blue deck of beings cards. The other player gets the red deck, representing the Southern Empire. Players also receive all of the circular pieces in their colour. Each player shuffles their own deck of cards and draws three of them into their hand, keeping them secret from their opponent. Take the deck of flare cards, shuffle them and place them next to the board. Each player draws one card from the flare deck and adds it to their hand. To prepare the task board, take all of the task cards and remove the advanced ones. Shuffle the rest and place them here. Deal the top three cards into the spaces below. These are the starting tasks. For your first game, the rules recommend that the starting tasks should only be worth one or two victory points, which is the number in the bottom right of the card. This task is worth three, so let's remove it and replace it with another. The other recommendation is that the starting tasks should each have a different symbol in the top left. So let's replace this one again and now we're all good. Finally, shuffle in any cards you discarded back into the deck and then reveal the top card. This is the next task. It's okay if this task is worth more than two victory points or has a symbol which matches one of the current tasks. This concludes the setup. So we've been through the components and we've done the setup. We're now ready to play. On a player's turn, they get to perform two actions except for the very first turn of the game when the starting player only gets one action. But after that, it's two actions a turn from then on. And there are only two different things that you can do with an action. You can either A, place one of your common pieces on an empty space on the board, or B, summon a being. 
One question I get asked a lot when teaching the game is can I move my pieces? And the answer to that question is no. Once a piece has been placed on the board, it can only be moved through the effects of certain cards. You can't voluntarily choose to just move your own pieces on the board. You might want to remind people of this when you're teaching them the game because the question does get asked a lot. Just remember only two things you can do. Place a piece on the board or summon a being. That's it. So now that we know this, let's take a look at the board and play through the first turn. Since summoning a being requires you to have pieces on the board in a specific pattern and the board is empty at the start of the game, the only choice the starting player has is to place a piece somewhere on the board. Let's say here. Now it's the turn of the Southern Empire, the red player, and he has two actions. He also cannot summon a being yet, so both of his actions are just to place red common pieces on the board. Let's say here and here. Deciding where to place your pieces on the board isn't as simple as it might first appear. As well as trying to match the patterns on the cards that you have in hand, you're also trying to keep an eye on your opponent, stop whatever evil plans they're up to, whilst also keeping an eye on the tasks that have been set for you. Anyway, we're about to summon our first being, but before we do, let's take a closer look at the being's cards and explain how they work. This is one of the cards from the Northern Empire deck, with the name of the being at the top. The icon in the top left shows the rank of the being. The Swordmaster is a common being. The pattern in the middle shows the arrangement of your pieces required to perform the summoning. The being itself appears on the white framed space. The text box below is the effect that the card has on the game immediately after it is summoned. If the text does not say something is optional, then you must carry out the effect. The Swordmaster, for example, includes the word May, so the effect is optional. Now that you understand the being's cards, let's go ahead and summon one. The Northern Empire player is pretty upset that these pesky southerners now have two pieces on the board to his one, so he decides to do something about it. As his first action, he places a common piece here. As his second action, he summons the Swordmaster. Note how the arrangement of pieces on the board match the pattern on the card. The magical forces are aligned correctly. Take a piece of the rank as shown in the top left of the card, in this case a common piece, and place it on the board in the square indicated by the white frame in the pattern. The spirit of a mighty Swordmaster is summoned forth. Next, follow the text on the card, which represents an attack by the Swordmaster, allowing us to destroy an enemy common piece on a diagonal square. It just so happens that there is one, so the Swordmaster swings her blade and delivers a devastating blow. The text also indicates that if we do destroy a piece, the Swordmaster herself is upgraded. She has gained experience in combat. Upgrading a piece means increasing its rank, in this case from common to heroic, so flip the piece over. If there was no enemy common piece on a diagonal square, or for some reason we chose not to destroy it, the Swordmaster would stay as a common piece. Once you have summoned a being and resolved its effect, the card goes to your discard pile. The piece on the board is no longer the being that you summoned. It's just a lifeless lump of calorite, a piece just like any other, with no memory of what it was before. Let's look at some other summoning examples now, using the Swordmaster. It's important to know that the pattern on the card is a minimum requirement for summoning. If you have more pieces on the board than are needed, that's okay. Also, if you have a higher rank piece than is needed, that's okay too. In fact, the space in which the Swordmaster will appear can also be occupied, as long as the piece that is already there is the same rank or lower. If the space is occupied by a piece of higher rank, however, that being cannot be summoned onto that space. In this example, the Swordmaster can be summoned, and doing so destroys the piece on the space where she appears. Even if the space contains one of your own pieces, the same rules apply. So in this example, you can still summon the Swordmaster, it destroys your own piece and replaces it with the piece representing the Swordmaster, which in this case just happens to be the same type of piece. This is another example where you can summon the Swordmaster. However, you can't use her effect since the text says that she can only destroy enemy common pieces. One of the pieces on the diagonal is your own and the other is an enemy heroic piece. Note that summoning the Swordmaster in this example is actually just the same as placing a common piece on the board, except for the Swordmaster card is no longer in your hand. The pattern on the card may also be rotated or flipped if required. 
So in the case of the knight, any of these patterns on the board are okay for the being to be summoned. In this one, the pattern is simply rotated, but in this one, the pattern also has to be mirrored. Some patterns show a piece inside the white frame square. This means that you have to have a piece in that square on the board and it's replaced by the new being that you summon. Remember that the piece in the square cannot be a higher rank than the being that you are summoning. This picture indicates the three possible squares onto which the cannon can be summoned. The cannon is a heroic being, so when it's summoned, the existing piece is replaced with a new heroic piece. Since the pieces are two-sided, it's usually easier just to flip over a common piece to heroic. If the piece on the board was already heroic, there's no need to actually change it for a different heroic piece. I mentioned earlier on that players cannot voluntarily move pieces on the board except when the effect of a card permits them to do so. There are a number of cards in the game that allow you to move pieces, so I'm going to spend some time explaining those now. A move is always to one of the eight adjacent spaces, four orthogonal and four diagonal. There are two types of move, standard moves and combat moves. They are very similar, but it's very important that players understand these so make sure to explain them clearly when you're teaching the game. First of all, either type of move can be made onto an empty square. Even if you're doing a combat move, that doesn't mean you actually have to attack something. With a standard move, you may also move your piece onto a square if that square is occupied, but only if the piece already there is of a lower rank. A combat move is basically a better version of the standard move, in that you may move your piece onto an occupied square if the piece already there is the same rank or lower. Moving to an occupied square destroys the piece that is there. In this example, the highlighted heroic piece is about to do a standard move. It could move to any of the spaces indicated. If it moves to one of these spaces, the piece that was there is destroyed. Note that you can destroy your own pieces this way. If, however, the piece was able to do a combat move, then it could move to any of these spaces. The only one it couldn't move to is the square occupied by this legendary piece, because that piece is a higher rank. Of course, we won't be using legendary pieces until the full game, but I wanted to show you here just to clarify. A leap is just like a move, except it may be to any space on the board. This type of move is often found on flying creatures, such as the griffon or the wild eagle. There are standard leaps and combat leaps. These work in exactly the same way as standard and combat moves. Each player's hand contains one flare card, which is drawn from the common deck. This card represents power that the mages can draw from their opponent's pieces when the magical forces in the arena are out of balance. It's a catch-up mechanic in the game to help players who have fallen too far behind. Each flare has an upper and lower part. If you meet the conditions for the upper part, you may play the card to get the upper effect. In a similar way, if you meet the conditions for the lower part, you get the lower effect. If you meet both of the conditions, you get both effects, the top one first and then the bottom one. You meet the upper criteria if the number of your opponent's upgraded pieces exceed yours by a certain amount, the number printed on the card. Heroic pieces and legendary count as upgraded pieces. In this example, the red player has three more upgraded pieces than you do. You have one, they have four, so you can play the card shown here. You meet the lower criteria if your opponent's total number of pieces exceeds yours by at least a certain amount. Again, the number shown on the card. In this example, your opponent has way more than five pieces more than you, so you definitely meet the lower criteria. You count all pieces regardless of rank. It's important to note that invoking a flare does not cost an action. It can be played before or after any action, but not whilst another action is being resolved. When you invoke a flare, resolve its effect and then place the card on the flare discard pile, just next to the flare deck. Let's take a look at some examples now, invoking flares. Red has two more upgraded pieces than blue, and three more pieces in total. Blue does not meet either criteria and cannot invoke this flare at this time. 
Red has three more upgraded pieces than Blue, so Blue meets the upper criteria only. Blue can invoke this flare and place one common piece on any empty square. Red has eight more pieces than Blue, so Blue meets the lower criteria only. Blue can invoke this flare to do one combat move or two standard moves. Red has four more upgraded pieces and four more pieces in total, so Blue meets both criteria. Blue can invoke this flare to get both effects. First, Blue places a common piece on an empty square. Then, Blue can do one combat move or two standard moves. Remember, invoking a flare does not cost an action. Here, Blue meets the lower criteria. However, part of the flare effect is to upgrade a common piece, and he doesn't have any on the board. So if he invokes the flare at the start of his turn, he gains an action, but he won't be able to use the upgrade part of the lower effect. Remember though, that flares don't have to be played at the start of your turn. So the blue player can use his first action to place a common piece. Red's pieces still outnumber his by six, so he can now invoke the flare after his first action to upgrade the common piece that he just placed. This still leaves him with two actions, his usual second action, plus the one that he's just gained from the flare. We explained how to set up the task board earlier on. There are always three current tasks displayed on large banners for all to see. The top card of the task deck is also face up, allowing players to see what task will come next once one of the three current tasks has been claimed. The text on each card indicates what conditions must have been met in order to claim that task. You claim tasks at the end of your turn and you can only claim one task per turn. So if you meet the criteria for more than one task, you may choose which one of those to claim. There are several types of task, identified by the symbol in the top left corner. Tasks with this symbol are accomplished by having your pieces on coloured squares at the end of a turn. Remember, an upgraded piece means one that is heroic or legendary. This type of task requires pieces in a certain configuration on the board at the end of a turn. Some of these also require upgraded pieces. These tasks require you to get into a certain position in relation to your opponent's pieces at the end of a turn. This symbol indicates that the task requires summoning in a specific way. Note that placing a piece on the board is not summoning. This is a common misunderstanding. Only using an action to summon a being counts as summoning. Finally, tasks with this symbol require you to destroy a certain amount of your opponent's pieces. Remember that if you summon a being onto a space occupied by an opponent's piece, that piece counts as destroyed, as does any card effect that allows you to destroy or even convert an enemy piece. At the end of a player's turn, they draw replacement cards so that they have three of their own beings cards and one flare card in their hand. So if on your turn you invoke a flare and summon two beings, you would draw two cards from your own deck and one flare card from the common deck into your hand. Once you've drawn replacement cards, if any, play them passes to your opponent. Unless you and your opponent agree to play with different rules, players should be free to take back any of their actions and do them differently. This is especially useful when learning the game, as players will often play a card, move a piece, and then realize, ah, no, it doesn't do the thing I wanted. Sometimes you may even want to take back an entire action and do something else completely. This is okay, and I actually don't think it slows the game down too much. In fact, by not allowing it, players might spend more time thinking everything through in their head before moving anything on the board. Of course, at the end of your turn, once you've started claiming tasks and drawing replacement cards, then it's too late. You can't take anything back at that point. Now that we're nearing the end of the video, it's probably about time that I explain to you just how you go about winning the game. Your score is the total points of all the tasks that you have claimed so far, and you win the game once this score reaches six points or more. The game can also end if one player draws the last card from their own deck of cards. In this case, the player with the most points is the one that wins the game.
Let's quickly go over what we've learned. Players take turns. The starting player gets one action on their first turn, but after that, each player gets two actions per turn. The only two possible actions are to place a piece or summon a being. When you summon a being, place a piece of the appropriate rank on the board, destroying any piece that was already there, if it was the same rank or lower. Resolve the effect and then discard the card. Flares may be invoked on your turn if you meet either or both of the criteria. They do not cost an action to play. Resolve the effect and place the card on the flare discard pile. At the end of your turn, you may claim one of the three current tasks if you meet the requirements on it. If you claim a task, replace it with the next task. Draw replacement cards at the end of your turn so that you have three beings cards and one flare card in your hand. The game ends when one player reaches six points or when either player draws their last card from their deck. And that brings us to the end of this video. You've now got everything you need to be able to play your first game of Tash Kalar. In the next video, we're going to be covering the rules for the full game, where we get to use those legendary beings. Take care, and thanks for watching. Now, where did I put that fire dragon?